I'm Amy Gutman, and this is Perspectives in Motion, an original podcast about the people, the places, and the ideas shaping our lives in the age of urbanization, brought to you by Schindler. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you're a returning listener, it's good to have you back. A quick note that this conversation was recorded prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. We're joined by Natalie DeFries, co-founder and principal architect of MVRDV, an interdisciplinary studio that works at the intersection of architecture and urbanism based in the Netherlands. DeFries focuses her work on a range of scales and typologies, all grounded in connecting individuals, communities, and environments. In addition to her work at MVRDV, DeFries moonlights as professor of architectural design at Delft University of Technology. In her role as principal at MVRDV, DeFries challenges her team to think about how, through the application of research-based methods, a building can be as inclusive as possible. Welcome, Natalie. Welcome, Amy, here at MVRDV in Rotterdam. Let's start from the beginning. What first inspired your pursuit of a career in architecture? Well, as a child, I was already very interested in drawing and looking at houses, interiors. I was drawing city maps, uh, even. Uh, And by the time I was an adolescent, I got interested in uh, the style movement, uh, a very uh, well-known 20th century art movement. But it also included a lot of architects and... uh, What was also very interesting about this movement, that it was also uh, very much caring about the social aspects of design. Uh, It was a time of uh, huge uh, industrialization and uh, and urbanization. And these architects tried to think of ways to make living more pleasant. And what's interesting about the Distill movement as such an influence for you is that that notion of uh, social good or social inclusion is really a common theme throughout many of your projects and your career. Yes, um, maybe it's also a bit a typical Dutch uh, thing. We are very much interested in making housing, uh, 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 mass housing, very, very good in the Netherlands and uh, definitely started uh, at the turn of the, of the, of the 20th century. Um, And we also realize that uh, it really shapes our society as well. Uh, We can create better neighborhoods. The the society is more egalitarian. So you could say as a Dutch architect, these things come a little bit as a given. Uh, But once you start to work with it, but also cross borders, you realize also how special it is actually and how how interesting it is that... uh, that a lot of people can benefit from good architecture and urban design. And actually, I think what's so interesting nowadays is that as the world gets smaller and people become much more aware of what's happening across borders, so much, so many of these Dutch ideas around social inclusion and equality are being replicated in other areas or adapted in other areas. So you're able to have a much greater influence globally. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, luckily, uh, we're not the only country who does this. But yeah, Dutch architects uh, have set some examples, have been followed. Um, and it also brought us across uh, many borders. I, I think what is also very particular about our way of working is that we like to combine different scales uh, of design in our designs. Yeah? So making uh, attractive uh, cities uh, does not stop uh, uh, at one scale or another. It's, it's about good housing, but also good, good neighborhoods, good planning. There's already a history of great global interest in the way the Dutch do certain things, specifically with the way they approach urban planning as it relates to things like bicycle lanes, pedestrian lanes, having more feet and and bicycles on the road than cars. Uh, we've also seen it in terms of um, different different ways of tackling the challenge of, of where to house everyone that needs to populate a city from houseboats and how to handle rising tides, uh, how to handle urban farming. What are some of the ways that you've seen the world really take notice and uh, and try to replicate some of the urban planning um, challenges here in the Netherlands? And, and what do you think has really served as a great example that can either be adapted or or replicated? Well, I, I think um, 
when I look at the beginning of, of our own uh, office, we were very much engaged in how can we make denser populated uh, uh, areas still attractive eh, as we live more and more in urban under urban conditions and in under denser conditions. Uh, it's important uh, to mix and mingle uh, a lot, for example. So what does that mean for typologies? We made silo dam building in which we have very different types of people eh, from affordable housing to, to more luxurious apartments. Uh, uh, what we try to do always is connect still to the streets, make internal streets as well, uh, semi-public spaces in buildings. And this is something that we apply until today, for example, when we work in San Francisco on uh, the Mission Rock project, where, uh, again, different types of people will be uh, put together in the, in the building, share facilities. Uh, as in the silo dam, we made this huge balcony, uh, privately built public space uh, in the water, because it's uh, in the River Ei in Amsterdam. In Mission Rock, we create a very nice area inside uh, the building that's accessible during the day for everybody uh, and can be shared by everybody living in the apartment. So that means you live in a big building, but even if you live at the top uh, or on the other side, uh, you can still go there and, and use all these shared spaces uh, and amenities. So that it's a little bit as if there's a little uh, neighborhood inside your building. This is, this is important to make uh, cities uh, livable, to make uh, neighborhoods uh, livable as well. You mentioned the silo project in Amsterdam, and you also referred to internal streets or roads. Yeah. Explain what you mean by that. Well, it's already actually using metaphors, I think, because uh, some would say, okay, that's the corridor or the hallway to your elevator. Uh, but what we like to do is to add extra spaces and areas, and we refer to them as if they were on the street, let's say, or in a neighborhood. So actually they are vertical neighborhoods, as we call them. So, uh, And this helps to overcome the idea of uh, uh, anonymity also in cities. Uh, the Netherlands is, uh, is a densely populated country, yet we managed for a long time that people uh, did not live under very dense uh, conditions. So, uh, yet we live closely together. So how you handle these things, like how can you maybe get the same quality of life that you would have, that you used to have in row houses inside buildings. We experiment a lot with big balconies, bringing green uh, onto uh, that, uh, the people like to still have an outdoor space. Uh, and in, uh, let's say, more suburban or uh, edge uh, of the city conditions, in the silo dam, we had a lot of, lot of different types of house. We are all different, and uh, we think it's important that we not just make one type of uh, apartment for everybody, but that we offer as architects more differences. However, we also discovered uh, uh, along the time that it's, it's also very interesting to be able to influence your own environment. So throughout the, the 25 years that our office uh, exists, more than 25 years, gradually we also started to make other plans. For example, if I take the project in Leiden, uh, that's actually a master plan. And we figured out a way how you could build townhouses in quite a dense way and in an affordable way. People park their cars there under the house and they were able to build their own house in their own uh, preferred style. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, that's, that requires a whole different type of design. In fact, you have to design the city without actually knowing what the style of the architect will be, because that's an individual choice. Some people argue that the role of the architect has become obsolete. Others contend that it's merely adapting, like most other professions. What's your take? Oh, definitely the second one. And um, yeah, there's a lot of specialization going on also in the building uh, industry and in design. But still, I think it's very uh, interesting to have people like architects who actually, uh, at the core of their work, have to integrate many uh, aspects of design. Because it is uh, uh, building is about making pleasant places, but also about integrating techn technological aspects. Uh, you build parts of a city, there's politics involved, there's economic aspects. All these elements are part of, uh, of can be part of our design. Um, 
And with the, with the change into more digitalization, for example, we see even a more uh, uh, intense collaboration also between the many uh, partners in a design process. Uh, but to oversee it and to bring it together, and there's also the aspect of aesthetics, of course. Do we like it? <laughs> Is it pleasant? <laughs> Does it fit? Uh, all these things. Do we innovate? Uh, these are important roles for architects. Presumably, people are more design literate than ever before. Absolutely. And we like that, actually. So it even comes to a point now where we can sometimes think, uh, where does our work stop? And how can we facilitate this uh, interaction of people with their own uh, living environment? Uh, some people dream of building their own house. Well, in the Netherlands, there are very few plots to be able to do that. But can we do that also in a more dense uh, uh, environment? Or uh, how can we keep that affordable? Usually fewer resources makes a person more resourceful. Absolutely. And we're, we're a bit a country of averages, uh, but we're also a country that likes to think about how can we make things accessible for as much as possible people. So that means as an architect, you always juggle with this. Uh, but it also uh, makes us more uh, inventive, I think. So where do we spend the money? What's the most essential thing to to provide in this uh, in this design? And no space is wasted in Dutch no design. No space is wasted. Actually, we have made a sport, and it's also an important theme for our project, to double, triple, uh, quadruple the use of land. Uh, not just by building high rises, but also thinking about maybe we can use land for even more uh, uh, aspects of uh, of this uh, of a design for 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 agriculture, for making parks, uh, for the production of energy. I actually started to coin this thing, and it's also what I teach to my students as multiplicity in design. So you never have a single use for something you do as a designer. And in these times of climate change, for example. We have to give everything a double meaning, energy producing, safe space, produce maybe even energy, uh, think about more green in our environments, uh, not take away all public space, but but bring it back again. And uh, yeah, so these are things which are at the root of our, of our office and of our work. What's interesting is that The old way of thinking was that only people living in densely populated urban areas, cities like New York, London, where space is at such a premium, need products uh, like IKEA produces, where a table can either be <laughs> extended for eight people or collapsed for mm -hmm. two and then snuck away in the corner <laughs> when needed the yeah. rest of the time. Yeah. Uh, but it seems increasingly that people outside of cities too are looking for dwellings, whether mm -hmm. that's residential or commercial, that perform multiple functions mm -hmm. and that aren't frivolous in nature, though they may, may be luxurious um, at different levels, mm -hmm. they are looking for that multi-purpose functionality. Yes, that's that's true. So it's it's indeed uh, it's part of our time, I guess, that we think uh, think about things in in all of these ways. Maybe it has to do with digitalization, where we learn uh, to think in different layers and in different uh, yeah possibilities. Uh, also, I think urbanism has been greatly influenced actually by digitalization. Of course, if you think about how we move around nowadays in cities. Uh, yeah, we can take much more decisions uh, last moment. It offers a certain freedom. Uh, and also in the design of cities, of course, we see also that, for example, modes of transport start to get much more equal because of that. Eh? You, you have a choice. Uh, and so there's not lo no longer anymore a prevalence of, uh, of just a car or, or, or trains, but people switch uh, between different uh, modes of transport. The biggest worries nowadays is more accessibility, uh, that it is available for everybody, than, uh, than actually uh, the mode itself. What do you think are the most pressing challenges facing cities today? Well, a lot of the things we've been talking about uh, have to do with how to make all the different scales of our city design come together in a nice way. 
So very pressing is not just, just to focus on one aspect, uh, but to really look at things from different angles. So yes, we do need good uh, houses uh, and living uh, conditions for everybody, even although they're getting uh, smaller maybe for, for, for many of us. Uh, we still need to have a good quality, but we also have to still think on regional scales because, for example, uh, it's nice if you make a nice in a city, but because of gentrification, people can be pushed out. That means more uh, attention for, for infrastructure is needed again. So uh, I think it's very important uh, at the moment to think about good quality on many different scales, levels of, uh, of design. We need good regional planning as well as attention for livability of streets. Um, and I think this means that we need very good interactions between all the people who work on all these levels of, uh, of design and architects. And we also need architects who can, who can switch between all these different levels of, uh, of uh, design. So arch architects, like the rest of us, really need to develop multiple skills to <laughs> to yeah. do their jobs well these days. Well, I think it's also have an open eye for all the conditions that are needed to, to create uh, great cities. Um, and don't think you can just solve it by making a great facade uh, of your building, for example. Uh, I think one of the most important dialogues at this moment, again, is uh, we need uh, countries to take responsibility again, uh, and regions to take responsibilities again. Um, yes, the market can solve maybe many things, but we also need good infrastructure and a philosophy on how we divide our spaces amongst each other in a city and who can access it. So it's really this collaboration, and I think architects uh, can help to make this work. Uh, we make, for example, a uh, small example, an art depot at the moment in Rotterdam. It's a public building for our art museum here, but it's also partly funded by private parties. We can make a new uh, rooftop on it that's publicly accessible. It's the depot of a museum. It's still going to be publicly accessible. So we need these collaborations between the public and the private to create better designs in the future. We're sitting here in the Dutch city of Rotterdam, which has itself undergone a transformation fairly recently uh, with a massive structure <laughs> that, that you helped design, the Market Hall. This has become such an icon of the city, not just for residents, but also as a mechanism for tourism. I mean, it's practically put Rotterdam on the tourist map. Explain what was behind this. Was that always the intention? And are there other cities that could benefit from such a structure? Um, the Market Hall is, is a result of a process that has been started in, uh, in Rotterdam uh, 20 years ago when they discovered there were not enough people living anymore in the city. The, the downtown was basically uh, aimed at working and retail, uh, but it was very boring uh, and it needed, uh, yeah, it needed more, more people, actually. So uh, from a certain point on, the city said, whenever you make a new building, it also always should include housing. So we have a lot of these mixed use projects now in the, in the city, uh, and uh, we really see the city changing. But we think uh, that uh, if we combine different functions, we can also make completely new type of buildings with that. So a simple market suddenly can become something very nice. It's, it's totally publicly accessible, of course, and it really helped as a catalyst also for its environment. Uh, so, uh, it became so attractive that it also influenced uh, the developments uh, around it. So, and we need every now and then such a point in our cities that uh, help to revive uh, the city in a good way. So it's had a, a multiplying effect. Yeah, it's it's really it's 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 the the result is more than the sum of the parts. One could say, and and we believe very strongly that if we look uh, more carefully at how we combine different functions in our city, yeah, this uh, living, working. Uh, retail, uh, public functions, uh, we can make such more exciting uh, places that make life uh, nice in, uh, in cities and that still create identity. And in this case, also identity that is unique. I mean, 
there's so much talk always about how all inner cities look alike with the same shops and the same formulas. Uh, in this case, of course, it became something very unique. <laughs> and that's, I think, why it's also seen as something important for the identity of the city. Could a concept like the Market Hall be applied across the world in different cities? Or do you think it, would, it might require adaptations? Are there certain cities where something like this could work? And are there certain cities where it might not work? And, and what, what could be the obstacles? Well, for, for a country like Netherlands, indoor markets were not that normal. But we, we actually took uh, 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 markets in, in Southern European countries uh, as our example. So they exist already for 100 years. Uh, and, they, and they are wonderful. You could say that we translated it uh, for the Dutch uh, context, but uh, I think in general, it's nice to see that not everything has to uh, look alike. So I think if one would copy it, uh, I think it is nice to celebrate people coming together, even uh, if it's related to shopping, uh, uh, in, an, in a nice way to introduce art uh, as well, to create different spaces and spaces that are not always uh, looking alike. And I think also for the apartments, instead of just uh, uh, repeating the same type, um, in this case, very unique houses were created that have these views to this market uh, as well. So you could see in a sea of houses, suddenly this different type of house is, uh, is made, which is also interesting. Continuing the theme of inclusion, you and your team worked on a very big project, or at least a project with very big impact, uh, across borders in the city of Almir, where social housing has been a challenge, but equally social housing has been a challenge in so many places. And you you came up with a very interesting solution to it. Explain that. Yeah, well, uh, the, the city of Almir uh, uh, some years ago experimented very much with how can we uh, make sure that a larger portion of, of the costs of building are actually benefiting the future users uh, and owners of, of houses. So they started to experiment with how do we make urban planning? Do we need everybody involved in the process? And they also challenged us to come up with ideas uh, to organize space in, uh, in a different way. Uh, like I said, also with the aim to make it possible for people to, to live their dream, to not uh, uh, spend a lot of money that is actually uh, uh, going to, to developers uh, instead of into the plan as a profit. Uh, but it also required a sort of radical new thinking about uh, urban design. So the idea is that mm -hmm. the homeowners buy the government land and then they can choose from a selection of different dwellings no, actually, that's that's completely free. You buy land, uh, and you get the obligation to put to do some things by yourself. Uh, you have to build roads sometime. Uh, think about how you create your sewage systems and all of that. Uh, but in return, the land is cheaper. Okay. So, but you can invest more freely in it. So, if you want to go for a very sustainable way of cleaning your wastewater, for example, that's possible. If you want to live in a huge caravan. It's possible if you want to build an earth, want to build an earth house. It's possible if you want to build something together with a group of people. It's possible. So basic infrastructure is there, but you provide a lot of things connected to your house, and there's also artistic freedom. One could say to build the house in the style uh, that you want. As uh, designers, we tend to have an idea to be in control of everything until the last uh, screw, uh, let's say, in the door. Uh, but it's also very challenging to think of ways to design in a more interactive way and in more open systems. So, and this is, I think, what we're facing. Uh, I always call it the emancipation of the user. So uh, I very much believe in diversity, actually, also in uh, our spatial environment. We should have freedom to move to different types of uh, places. We should have more freedom how we uh, live in, a, in our house. Uh, it's an important challenge also for the future if, that, to think more about changeability of our environment. Housing and mobility go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Mm -hmm. What are some of the current obstacles that we're facing in terms of mobility and transportation? 
Um, I think it's very important to um, pay more attention to public uh, transport in, in urban planning. Uh, and um, so it is, we're, we're, we're going towards a time when less and less people have their own uh, cars, for example. So accessibility to public transport is becoming uh, increasingly uh, important. We also see now in our projects that sharing uh, different modes of transport is becoming important eh? so that you have in your place uh, access to to shared uh, cars, for example. What cities around the world do you think are getting the mobility issue right? I think many of the Dutch cities, uh, especially the bigger ones, are are transforming their inner cities uh, towards more space for pedestrians and cyclists. You know, cycle, cycling is an important mode of transport in the Netherlands. Uh, there's also now a growth of electric uh, bicycles, so that, be, that people who are commuting uh, are still cycling, but in a in a faster uh, in a faster way. So that's getting very important. And you see also, uh, we have to think now about all the car parks and car park structures in our building. Are we still going to make them? To which uh, extent? So that's an important uh, element in our uh, design. Uh, in general, we try to move cars in our, our master plans more to perimeters and to make the spaces between buildings uh, completely pedestrianized. So... I also like, of course, Scandinavian countries, cities like Copenhagen. You see uh, there they make really big uh, moves uh, in, uh, in getting uh, the bikes in. Uh, and cities uh, become more agreeable. I mean, the air is less polluted. Uh, this, is, this is very important to say, uh, yeah, to give uh, walk, uh, people who walk, people who cycle, first way. I'm thinking, too, of Swiss cities where all of the trains and the metros are connected by time. So the last train to arrive and say, yeah. uh, Zug, uh, also allows for two minutes or whatever it is to catch the last metro and everything yeah. is very carefully coordinated. Carefully coordinated, indeed. And you see that also, for example, around uh, Dutch station areas, and I see that copied also uh, around the world uh, a lot, that uh, uh, it's they really call it now not just a station, but a multimodal knot. Uh, bus and tram areas are modernized eh, from, from very gloomy places. They are now uh, fresh and open and, and very dynamic. And indeed, uh, with the help of digitalization, we can also now make much better decisions on what mode of transport uh, to use. So, um, And uh, I think the next step is, uh, because our cities are still growing, is to bring indeed public transport to the far edges of the uh, of our cities. So I admire very much uh, cities that have a very nice uh, subway system, for example, uh, cities like Tokyo, and uh, that's, that's very, very nice. But equally, as you say, it's about having multiple modes of transport available in, in very dense places so that, let, you know, metros break down, things happen, there are delays. Yeah. It just gives the commuter more choice to hop on a bus instead if they need to Indeed. or find Indeed. It, pick yeah, up I, a bike. I, yeah. I, I like it very much, for example, a city like Singapore that thinks about connecting all their bicycle lanes in a, in a, in a fast way yeah, to make a sort of second infrastructure for cyclists throughout uh, the city. So indeed, uh, it's not about being dependent on one mode of transport, but creating different layers of networks. Uh, looking at the dots and make that work. That's that's a big challenge, uh, I think. Are there any cities that you think are really pushing the boundaries on smart urban design? I think there are many cities that do things good on a certain level. I always admire in Germany, for example, how great playgrounds they make uh, in their cities uh, and give, make, make space for, uh, for children. Um, when I was uh, young, I studied as an intern in Barcelona, where they just started this program of creating fantastic public spaces and plazas inside uh, the cities. Um, a country like Denmark, uh, in Copenhagen, there's a whole program of building very nice community centers and neighborhood centers. 
combining sports, uh, uh, healthy uh, eating, and uh, libraries uh, in buildings that contribute also very much to uh, to the quality of life in uh, in neighborhoods. Uh, and uh, yeah, so all these public spaces and places are very important for cities that are ever changing. That have new groups of people coming in. Uh, in neighborhoods, I mean, cities are never stopping <laughs> to develop. And we need these sort of intermediary spaces to meet each other and to agree uh, uh, with each other uh, on our work. And um, I, uh, we always try to uh, persuade also commercial clients to incorporate public spaces or interactions with public spaces in and on and beside their design. Make great roofs, make great plazas and streets, open up interiors. Uh, as much as possible, uh, especially during the daytime. Uh, so there are more connections, more porosity in uh, in cities. It sounds like we're coming full circle here to where we began, which is that not only architects, but urban planning at the government and the private level need to be more multi-pronged, multi-coordinated, and multi-skilled. Some cities are getting the recreational places right, some cities are getting transportation right, but it sounds like there's still a lot of work to be done in yeah. forming a city or redesigning a city to be truly connected on all the levels that matter. I think one of the important challenges of our time is the growth of cities. So yes, we, t we started 25, 30 years ago in rethinking uh, the densification of our own country and the influence that had on our quality of life and on the equality that we like, uh, the equal opportunities we like to give to everybody in this uh, country. Nowadays, we have to think about these things on a much larger scale. And uh, yeah, and it, it is a very uh, interesting interplay, one could say, between public and private partners. But uh, to solve this on much larger scales, also, again, uh, needs, needs rethinking and reorganizing our ideas about uh, space. But I think it tremendously helps if cities have a good view on what they think is important for the quality of life. And uh, I think uh, those cities that have that vision are the ones that you also see thriving, uh, uh, of course. Uh, and um, yeah, so, so but dealing with this growth means that from the, from the nice downtowns and the market halls, but also to the edges in the, of, of our development, we have to achieve uh, the same qualities. So that's also why we, as architects, also always take up not just the key uh, uh, mid-city uh, projects, but we're also uh, interested in the edges, in buildings that have to be transformed for a future age, for cleaning up the, the mess we made maybe uh, some decades ago when everything should be car-oriented. Malls, uh, office parks, all these areas... We end each podcast with the same question, which is if you could change one thing about the current global conversation on urban planning, what would it be? <laughs> well, I think what's very important uh, at this moment <laughs> in time is to think about cities really as big ecologies uh, as well and not to focus too much just on one aspect, but to look from, from the downtown to the edges of cities and beyond uh, to the development of our cities. And I think it would be very important to, to, to say to each other, we want to achieve the same qualities of uh, life for everyone, everywhere where we are going. Um, so that means to give the same attention to, to the interaction between the public and the private, whether you're working in a business park, whether you're transforming old malls, uh, or whether you're uh, gentrifying uh, areas uh, in the center. Um, yeah, we need uh, uh, equal attention uh, everywhere. Thank you, Natalie. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Amy. You've been listening to Perspectives in Motion, an original podcast from Schindler. I'm Amy Gutman. You can find additional episodes, guest bios, and other related content on our website, schindler.com backslash podcast. <laughs>